Hello, welcome to the Moonstruck Podcast, uh, produced by Riot Radio, where we focus on the subjects relating to scientific spirituality and motivational philosophy. I'm Ryan, and today we'll be discussing uh, some references from the Bible, uh, the sword and the thread of fate, um, particularly the Michael sword as depicted in the Bible. And the last, we'll talk about the mental redemption or reconstruction of self. So let's start off today talking about um, some scripture, actually. We'll go back to an earlier episode where we covered some quotes around Revelation. And one of the reasons why today I particularly want to focus on this mystical object known as the flaming sword or the Michael sword is because it is really imperative to the aspect of the self that deals with mentality. And I think that one of the things that this was depicting as an object in the Bible was the aspect of battle. And not necessarily just in a sense of fighting, but in a sense of will and direction. And we can implement that into our own lives and our own mentality and how we kind of persevere in the world through obstacles. So... We're going to talk about kind of this sword that, you know, is said to um, slay the ones that dwell in the abyss, right? We're talking about Satan and the demons and, you know, all the uh, ones that were kind of the rebellious side uh, when the big battle of heaven took place. So in Revelation 12, uh, 7 to 9... The passage describes Michael leading the heavenly host into battle against the dragon or Satan. And it says, while a sword is not mentioned, the context of battle and Michael's role as a warrior angel has led artistic depictions of him with a sword. So wh why is this? What is really the uh, main depiction around this sword and what does it represent? And I think that it represents the direction of the ultimate alignment of the cosmos. And in, in that sense, what I'm kind of referring to is that this object is something that has the ability to slay the greatest beings in creation essentially the archangels and you know sometimes they're referred to as jinn in uh the quran or demons or spirits um and this really kind of illustrates a aspect of omnipotence around uh this sacred object and I think we already mentioned this quote in a previous episode, but I'll go back to it again just for reference. Um, it says, The war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called Devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to earth and his angels with him. So this sword as kind of depicted, uh, maybe we can actually go to an image where he has a big flaming sword in his hand and it's on fire. Yeah, as you can see, this kind of represents an instrument of smiting these lower forces. And in reference to us and our kind of interpretation of this, this represents an object capable of cutting the thread that leads to things like addiction, bad habits, um, stagnation in life, pretty much things that impede you or impedes your will from going in which direction it wants to go. And it's mainly utilized in opposition to combating forces that would hold you back or undermine your authority in this case of you know biblical reference so this really represents an object that is meant to take back power or take back will or take back um, some sense of stability in the universe 
And when we're talking about things in relation to our life and how we can implement these things, it's imperative really that we we kind of sift through what is in the scripture and what is the true meaning behind what these objects represent. I find a lot of the time really when I look at these texts or when I read stuff from um, certain religious books that it's not about what the passage actually says, it's about what is the message or lesson or um, I guess the information that is encoded in the text in the sense that it might not be apparent in a sense that, you know, the archangel is actually holding up a flaming sword as it is depicting um, an instrument that is a representation of something else. In this case, um, the freedom or righteousness of heaven in the sense that um, a land that is kind of pure and kind of un untampered with um, or unmanipulated in a sense, a land of pure light. And I think it's kind of interesting that in a lot of depictions of this sword we see it on fire because as we've talked about in previous episodes, the jinn as referred to in the Quran are said to be born from a smokeless flame of fire. And if you think about it, the archangels wielding this big sword and he's going into battle against, you know, the forces of evil or forces of darkness or whatever you want to call it. And essentially, he's cutting them down with the very essence of what they're said to be made from. So I think there's some kind of synchronicity almost to that where you see a lot of these themes pop up where you know for example why is the sword on fire why wasn't it like blessed with water or or like why is it not some immaterial object or you know why is there not like lightning bolts coming out of the sword or something like that or some other extravagant theme and i think the reason is because to cut down the beings that are manifested from fire you must possess an instrument that in itself is an aspect of fire or has an aspect of fire to it so this really this instrument what guided the angels into battle against the third of the angels that decided to side with satan um, was really kind of a conscious direction into battle it was a will, it was a direction, it was an instrument of um, something that you would use to symbolize were ready to uh, combat you, in a sense. Not in a sense that, you know, this sword was the pinnacle of everything, but in a sense that it represented a greater idea. It represented um, the rebuking of lower forces trying to overwhelm the heavenly host so i think it's also interesting that we, when we look at things like the archangel michael his name is said to be the one who is like god so if the one who is like god is holding his sword up and going to slay the demons then i think that that represents something in the sense that these lower forces that are seeking to cause chaos in the world or really cause disharmony or disunity especially that word disunity um, because the aspect of spirituality kind of describes as you move up through these realms to realms like heaven things become more unified and it, they become more harmonized but when things sink back down into the lower planes of existence uh, such as the physical realm and, you know, the lower astral or the eighth sphere as it's sometimes referred to, you get these lower forces that just seek to cause chaos, um, even though their purpose might represent uh, a bigger lesson in the sense that they need to be there in order for creation itself to learn something, but they're not the end-all and be-all source to creation or they're not the highest most righteous most aligned force in creation i know this is kind of very biblical and you know spiritual and we're kind of we'll kind of get into the applicability aspect to this material 
in uh, later parts of the show, but I just kind of wanted to express the, uh, I guess, paramountness of what this instrument kind of represents. Because when you get an understanding of what it represents and what it's capable of doing to these lower forces and what its place is said to be in the Bible, then you can figure out how to apply that to yourself, right? Um, so in Joshua 5.13 to 15, it actually says that although not explicitly named as Michael, this passage describes a figure as, to as the commander of the army of the Lord. Appearing to Joshua with a drawn sword, this figure is often interpreted in Christian tradition as uh, appearance of Christ or an angelic being sometimes associated with Michael. So I'm not going to read the whole verse, but that's essentially what is being described in that specific passage. And I think that it's kind of, it's, there's an interesting factor to the fact that the strongest archangel, why would he need a sword? And I think it's to emphasize his position as the highest archangel or the one who is like God, as it's said, um, and not necessarily something that he needs in order to, um, I guess, actualize his power to the highest degree, as it is a sense of um, maybe another example would actually be God sitting on a throne, as sometimes depicted. It's not necessarily that God needs a throne, it's that the throne itself represents something and akin to his position sitting on it. I think it's the same thing with the sword, that the sword is representing a greater or larger aspect of life or in specific relativity to this archangel's presence. He is a warrior to do battle, right? So kind of getting into the philosophy end of this in the sense that what can we pull from this and kind of extract to um, allude to a greater understanding of something and we'll start by talking maybe about uh, this concept sometimes referred to um, in the occult or this object rather and it's called the loom of fate and it's said to be a mystical object uh, that's threads actually are invisible all through the cosmos and these threads actually lead to certain events playing out in the physical world and in other dimensions and stuff like that and essentially it represents the aspect of reality that's woven in a specific way and when you have this sword almost when you have self-actualized yourself to a place where in a representational aspect, you have your sword, you have your um, aspect of the self almost in your hand, in the palm of your hand, and nothing can kind of intrude on you or invade your presence to the point where you are not doing uh, what you should be doing. So maybe an as uh, example of this, this is one I've used in the past actually when talking about some negative behaviors or um, intrusive habits. Let's say you make a dedication to go to the gym today. Like you said to yourself, okay, today we're getting the gym in, blah, blah, blah. Or today we're getting some form of exercise in whatever. And you do not fulfill that. That is some negative aspect of yourself impeding you on the goals that you said you were going to do. Because if you didn't have something impeding you, you would do it. And I know a lot of, you know, people say like, oh yeah, well, I, I, things change, I didn't have time in that day. Well, usually most of the time what it actually is, is that you've given yourself a reason to excuse yourself from doing that thing. So it doesn't take so much work to, you know, go and do whatever little exercise you said you were going to do or fulfill on whatever promise you made to yourself. Um, but when you use the outside world as an excuse to say that, okay, well, this happened, so I can't do this or whatever, you're breaking promises to yourself and you're not 
um, living up to basically your own self image that you have put forth. So it's one thing if you say generally overall, I'm going to try and look better. But it's another thing if you say this day specifically, I have to get this amount of exercise done or whatever it is. Or, you know, I, uh, I, I have to make this meal so that, you know, my, my weekly, uh, um, diet or my weekly meal plan is planned out or whatever you said to yourself that you're going to do that that day, fulfill that, do that that day. Right. And this is not necessarily saying that, you know, you have to be super hard on yourself or anything. It's saying that if you say something to yourself that you're going to do, you follow through on it. Because when you don't, you have two aspects of the self competing with one, one another. So it's almost like don't make promises to yourself that you can't keep um, because it will only hinder you and hinder your own self image more than it will push you forward. And I think part of that is honestly knowing your own limits and knowing what you can do. If you think you're not going to be able to get something done in a day and you think it's better left for the next day or whatever, then don't make your a promise to yourself that day that you're going to do it, right? So I think this sword kind of is the aspect that represents you when you are in touch with that version of yourself that is following through on things that he puts his will into doing, right? And how to apply that to, you know, this aspect of, or a uh, concept rather of the loom of fate and, you know, how the sword comes into it is that when you have the sword in your hand, metaphorically obviously um you can you can almost cut the threads of this loom that would inhibit you in some way and this honestly has to do with that idea again of releasing karma and releasing baggage and releasing self-doubt and things that hold you back um on your spiritual evolution and i know we talked last week about the philosopher's stone and what that kind of represents in this aspect of transmutation and this aspect of um, manipulating reality in certain ways. And the Philosopher's Stone is essentially the immaterial object of the self that you get when you have cut those threads of the loom with your sword, so to speak. You get this energy that is almost like, it's like quicksilver. It's something that moves very fast like fire and is very uncontrollable. And when you have actualized yourself to the fullest degree and cut these threads that inhibit you, it's almost like that energy is transformed back into the Philosopher's Stone and you become that actualized version of the self. And I know probably there's some of you thinking okay well ryan what does this have to do i don't have michael's sword in my closet at home but you know it's not it's not really about that it's more about what does the sword represent and can if i imagine this in my head like all these you know almost fairy tale objects or whatever can that convince me that i have the power to do what i set out to do if i imagine me, you know, cutting the threads of karma or whatever, or cutting out all the bad habits in my life, you know, like addiction, you know, uh, not going to the gym, whatever, not getting any sunlight, you know, cut all those out, cut out all the demons, all the gin, whatever, all the lower forces that would inhibit you. And what, what do you have left? You have pretty much the actualized version of the self. And it all comes back to this aspect of mentality, which is constantly changing based on what we observe in the outside world, what information we pick up and decide to attach to. Um, this is essentially the instrument that can detach you from the information that is not important and not relevant. Um, because 
a lot of the times I find we pick up information all over the place that does not serve us and that we don't need. Maybe comments, uh, you know, somebody said like, you know, maybe we were bumping into a friend and, uh, you know, I don't know, they, they said something that, you know, made you feel uneasy or something like that. That is, you know, some people will get fixated on those little things, but if it doesn't serve you and if it's not really relevant, then you can just discard it, right? It's not something to fixate over. So when you learn how to release this kind of stuff that is not important, you really have that Michael sword or rather the flaming sword in your hand and you really have the ability to kind of actualize that version of the self. Um, the reason why this is kind of important is because as we kind of um, go deeper into this, Maybe we'll get the next image, actually. Maybe the one where he's, like, battling back Satan and, you know, the demons and whatnot. Um, but it, uh, it's kind of interesting that, you know, we, we see this, this kind of big figure and all these, like, lower forces there. You know, you can see the angels kind of behind him in the background. But ultimately, he's, like, he's prepared to go into battle by himself, right? And... I think it, it kind of represents this concept again of unity, that natural law of the universe is that things like to be harmonized, they like to be in balance, and the universe does not like when things are not in balance. They become very unstable, um, they become uh, almost, um, if you think of the different states of matter, you got solid, liquid, gas, and, and plasma obviously. Um, but solid is obviously the most stable form of matter. Water, which Bruce Lee says, you know, be like water. It's because it's kind of in between a state of, you know, gas, which is very unpredictable. Um, and plasma, which is, you know, constantly changing, constantly uh, in a state of transformation. Um, which also kind of relates to this flaming sword. It's a... Uh, it's a sword that is in constant transformation and that's really the power that um, is needed to kind of overcome those forces of you know gin and whatnot smokeless flame of fire if you have a sword of fire and you can only attain that sword of fire when you realize the self and there's another image actually I want to go to and it's of the the chakra system again i know we talked about this in previous episodes um but as you can see if you look at the green ray and the yellow ray those two are specifically kind of what we're focusing on today and you can you can even look at this the star kind of represents the, the heart center which is kind of in correlation with cosmic alignment and this concept of the loom of fate you know you got all the threads here along the loom and this center below it or is the center of will or center of fire i can't draw fire so i drew a lightning bolt um but this is essentially where your sword is and when you self-actualize yourself and reach a level of spiritual awakening or enlightening enlightenment and this is the first enlightenment not cosmic awakening or cosmic enlightenment this is awakening of the self you kind of get that aspect of um self-knowing or understanding who you are and what your place is here in the material realm and kind of by doing that you that th this yellow center represents the sword and you kind of become the sword you embody the sword in the sense that you are an object that is relatively impenetrable impenetrable to any force out there as long as it is in your hand and what i mean by that by it's in your hand as in you know yourself and you're willing to take responsibility for your actions and what that means is that if you make a promise to yourself you got to follow through on it and if you want to do something in your life if you find something you really want to do let's say you want to create a business you have to follow through on it because if you don't you're going to be left with all the fallout from that which is things like regret 
which is things like uh, feeling not self-actualized, which is feeling maybe a lack of self-worth because you have not achieved that thing or the thing that you have placed value on to achieve because a lot of people achieve things and they sometimes don't really give too much appreciation for it because not out of you know they're narcissistic or anything like that but it's because they don't place value on that thing that they achieved maybe they place more value on some personal project or some kind of personal actualization which is more important to them so for example actually I'll give an example myself I didn't go to my graduation this year because I wanted to work on this show so I said to myself this is more important this is something I could be more proud of uh, when I have achieved something than going to grad because this is actually something that's meaningful for me so keeping that in mind you follow through on those things and you you end up getting the sword and when you've you know kind of cut all the threads you know you've you've become almost the embodiment of the philosopher's stone that you know immaterial object of ultimate transformation you essentially gain the seat within the self that sits at the solar plexus and i would refer to it as the seat of the city of jewels because they refer to the center as Manipura uh, in Hindu culture and it really represents you know the city of jewels is what what it's said to uh, be named or the city of riches or um, almost you could almost think of it as crystallines as well um, or objects that are very rare you can almost think about it as a city of diamonds if you want um, because when you self-actualize to this center, there is a natural flow and rhythm and you can feel almost your will inside you that is actualized to a certain state where you have a inherent knowing of what you're supposed to be doing. So if you are in this kind of state and you try to slack off on anything you're gonna feel that you know that uh, almost resentment to for for your aspect of the self when you for example don't do your push-ups or that you said you were gonna do or whatever it is right you said that you know I gotta complete for me you know it'd be you know 140 push-ups or whatever before the day is done then you have to follow through on that and finish that because if you don't you're gonna be like well I mean should I really I just ate blah 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 and you know you're gonna try and make up all these excuses but the fact is that if you did those push-ups before the day is done you would be more proud of yourself than you would be if you didn't do the push-ups so it's all about that mentality and kind of okay if I have a slight road bump here how is it going to look when I overcome it or how is it going to look when I drive right into it and you know piece of the transmission falls out of the car right so it's not gonna it's not gonna look too good um looking from that angle right so you want to make sure you get over that hurdle or you get over that road bump and when you do overcome that road bump you become stronger and every time it's just like working out every time you overcome an obstacle you get stronger you get a little bit stronger it might not be significantly noticeable but you did get stronger and you built your mental fortitude and that's the important thing at the end of the day understanding that it's just about continuing that mental fortitude and continue to strive along your path and understanding that you are in the driver's seat and nobody else can take the wheel for you nobody else can put that sword in your hand so you really have to actualize that version of the self if you want to be who you set out to be and when you do that things start, start to culminate around you things start to culminate you start to see different perspective on the world you start to see the effects of uh, compounding activities uh, such as you know 
you know, you got up early, you did your meditation, uh, you got your hair cut, took a shower, you did your podcast, you know, go work out, you know, that's, that's been my day so far. So that's, that's just an example of the compound effect of momentum. So when you do something, you get into that movement of the upward spiral, right? And it's facilitated by that moving energy. You started your day and you said that, okay, I got a list of things I need to do. I'm going to try and do all of them as precise as I can and keep moving along until the list is finished. And when you do that, you're moving with intention. And this is something to remember, moving with intention. When you move with intention, you move different through space and time. This is what Einstein was talking about, E equals MC squared and how you're moving in the universe. When you move with a singular focus or singular intention, your energy is less scattered. You're more in a, in a state of direct focus. And that's essentially what it means to have that sword. So you kind of also find this state of oneness of being or um, a flow of cosmic alignment. You know, you're not always thinking about, okay, what if this happens or what if that happens or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Is because you're just in that movement of doing right so you're not concerned about any other thing because you're just in the you're in the movement you know you're in the wave um, so to speak so maybe I'll take a breath and drink some water <laughs> another thing I wanted to mention when you do cut these threads these behavior patterns um, that do not serve you, you kind of reconstruct or redefine rather your ego boundary because what the sword is doing to these, you know, so to speak, demons or whatever, you're cutting away aspects of the ego and the shadow that do not serve you. So you get kind of a dissolvement of parts of your reality in the sense that things that you believed were true you realize they're not true you know uh let me think of an example um i don't know let's say you're defined by you know watching maybe a certain program on tv let's say you have a, a program you watch very religiously and you say that well I mean, I need my downtime at the end of the day, so I can't afford to, you know, outsource that, that time to do a different activity, right? That's a behavior or a belief system you have set internally within yourself. It's not necessarily true in its entirety. It's true for you at the moment, but it doesn't have to be. It's not the ultimate truth. Because the fact is that, you know, you can say that, you know, after you cut this behavior pattern, you see that, well, maybe I didn't need to spend my time doing that because I need less downtime than maybe I thought I did. Or maybe I'm able to get my downtime in some alternate form. So it's about kind of the belief systems that you shape around things. And really what this sword is representing is the ability to dissolve parts of the ego boundary and reconstruct them you know you're reconstructing almost reality and i think that that's really what um you know that sort of michael i don't know if we i think we had one more picture um i don't know if we could go to the last picture of him um i don't know if he had the sword in that picture but um but essentially you are kind of getting rid of these forces that are in the way you know there there's no longer a uh, a barrier on what you uh believe in your consciousness there's no sense of okay i cannot achieve this or i can only achieve this or whatever right you are cutting down those barriers and you see that okay well maybe the belief system that i held and what i believed or perceived to be true is not necessarily the ultimate truth maybe there is a reality where this is possible or this is possible or this is possible and all of these realities exist simultaneously but they're defined and uh basically interconnected by the actions that you take in the world and when you realize that 
these are all connected, you start to change your patterns and start to change your behaviors. You could say, I can do that. I just need to do, you know, X, Y, Z in order to get there. But you can see that, okay, there is a path forward to get to that place now because my mentality is shifted. What I perceive to be uh, true for myself is not necessarily the ultimate truth. Um, are we sure there's not one more picture up there? I think there's one more picture of... Yeah, I, that's the one. Um, so the reason why I chose this picture is because if you look at his sword in this picture, it's kind of interesting how that sword looks, right? Almost looks like akin to some kind of lightning bolt, right? Or, or a shape that is kind of, you know, in some kind of weird pattern or altered pattern. And I think the reason why that is, is because usually he has a sword that is on fire. But here, it, it just looks like a regular sword that is, you know, kind of wavy, right? So, this really kind of connects again with that idea of fire or reshaping the self, which is represented by the aspect of fire. And I think it's interesting how this is kind of a reoccurring theme in these religious books. Um, of fire and you know they talk about hell or purgatory or you know the naraka or whatever it's referred to um, in, in any text as a place of purification and a place of um, basically well purification for the most part where you are kind of relieving your sins you are you go there for a time and you essentially travel through this dimension where you know your sins are purged and whatever by fire and you know then you have a uh opportunity for redemption or you know you basically get stuck there or whatever the case is right um so this kind of reoccurring reoccurring theme of fire is one very prominent throughout all these uh, kind of religious scripture, uh, religious scriptures and mystical texts. So, I would not overlook kind of these aspects of, you know, the Michael Sword and over Loom of Fate and over um, the Philosopher's Stone because it's not about really some immaterial object which you have to get your hands on. It's about or material object which you want to get your hands on it's about an immaterial concept that you can apply to the self in a form of uh, attaining something akin to enlightenment or akin to awakening um, which is the state of self-realization and of understanding who we are so I think we've kind of covered quite a bit and I want to make sure that I haven't missed any of our text but I think it's I think it's a real interesting concept that when you have something like a instrument that is said to be able to you know kill an archangel or uh, slay demons or you know whatever it is depicted as in the bible even though from my research the aspect of the sword itself is not mentioned really in detail um, however when you kind of do implement some of these things in terms of um, an object that is capable of smiting these forces you realize that any force inside yourself that is you know represent representational of chaos or disharmony or disunity or any kind of form of energy that is a nuisance and impeding you from achieving your highest state of being is not in control it's not in control you the version of you that becomes most unified that becomes the most whole that believes 
one singular thing is the greatest version of yourself that exists inside you. Personally, I believe we exist simultaneously with other versions of self. In a sense, you could think about it like, for example, when you're around a certain crowd of people, you may speak a certain way or um, convey yourself in a certain way that maybe you don't um, particularly do when you're around another group of people. And that's because you're acting in accordance to the environment. So the real thing here is how do you interact with these different versions of the self and kind of uh, make sure they're all in harmony is you self-actualize to yourself you self-actualize yourself to the point where you can see in superiority to these forces you can see down on them and if we think of uh, what is commonly sometimes referred to in Hindu culture and um, Buddhist culture as the third eye we think about the third eye this is a, a force we see that opens and it looks down onto reality it's able to see all you know they say that in the land of the blind the one eye man is king and what that means is that when you have the vision when you can see what cannot be seen you are essentially in a state in akin to the creator because you realize yourself as the creator of your own reality so being able to see that vision and being able to utilize that force of the sword in order to get rid of these forces that are in your way you kind of hit a point where you say that okay i'm not my i'm not this person that has been constructed in my mind that i believe myself to be all these years and i'm not you know pretty much um i don't know uh, kind of how to describe it because it's almost like you realize you're in a state that's not pure materialism and not pure immaterialism not in a not a pure state of matter or memories or anything that you attach to your physical being and not in a state of energy or um you know pure waves or or force that uh, traditionally acts in the universe you're somewhere in between and that you realize yourself as just part of an energy on a spectrum which you can move between so it's almost like if you think about it when you do yoga you can sometimes see how far your body's ability uh, like is to relax you can see how much relaxation you could get from letting the muscles unwind and same thing in the gym you can see how tense and how dense your muscles can get when you you know go to the gym and lift weights and whatever because you're trying to provoke the materialism of matter instead of the materialism of energy and i think that's why things like yoga and uh exercise in terms of lifting weights are so good when they work together because they're acting in a polarity they're acting in a polarity where one is unwinding and one is winding so and when you kind of realize that you are in a state that is never just one or the other but you always are somewhere in between on that spectrum you realize you have the ability to become a lot of different things so and that is really the ability to interact with the alternate versions of self and by interacting with them you can eventually unify them into one kind of unified self uh, that has a singular focus in life or a superior fo focus in a sense that you have some ultimate direction to achieve one thing and everything else is acting in an ultimate accordance to that one thing you know so let's say um i don't know let's say you want to become a super rock star right and you know you want to um i don't know just just be like i don't know someone famous maybe like bon scott or someone right like um star of acdc right and you say that okay that's who i want to be 
and you know but you say okay well i want to look good while i'm doing it and you know i want to be able to um you know play lots of instruments so you know maybe implementing fitness is something you have to do in order to you know bring up the lifestyle aspect in terms of physique or looking good or whatever maybe um learning to play multiple instruments is something you need to do also in order to achieve that but all of those things are relative to the singular goal or singular focus that you have directed yourself towards but all of those versions of self that are learning those skills are acting in accordance to that one version of the self that is the self-actualized version that is the superstar rock star whatever that is you know able to get up there on stage and you know uh you know play play you know all those songs so the real moral of the story here is that when you realize what your potential is to do and you define who you want to be um out of that infinite potential of being then you can incorporate all those aspects of you know learning instruments getting your getting your health in check getting your fitness um you know lifestyle eating properly whatever it is you know maybe uh i don't know maybe you gotta like learn a certain lingo of how to you know how to speak or whatever you know like sometimes in in you know rock and roll they have you know certain words that you know you got to learn so maybe you got to learn a certain vocabulary of how to how to convey yourself or whatever but all of those are aspects in accordance to a singular focus so when you kind of realize that you realize that it's ultimately down to directing yourself to where you want to go and allowing the flow of everything else to fall into place and when you do that you have that self-actualized version of the self and all those versions that exist simultaneously with you are not in hindrance of that version of self they're in assistance of that version of the self and you don't have those things that would distract you um unless you know they're in a state where there are no longer distractions let's say you're somebody who you know maybe you used to have a problem with alcohol or something like that um now you can drink and you're not affected by um you know things like addiction or whatever because you have a goal in mind and that singular focus is preventing those negative patterns from manifesting themselves so by kind of directing yourself where you want to go those negative behavior patterns are almost smited out of subconscious instinct and you don't even have to think about it anymore because they're no longer in the way they no longer have the power to impede you because a much greater force is acting now on your life so i think we're gonna wrap it up actually before too long here because we actually qu covered quite a bit and i know we've jumped around for a, from a lot of concepts that we've maybe talked about in previous episodes or in previous weeks but i really wanted to get that idea in that you have the potential to interact with all of these forces philosopher stone you know flaming flaming sword uh loom of fate all of these already exist everything that you need you already have all you need to do is dig deep and find it so it already exists inside of you and <laughs> how is it put there's a great power inside you waiting to be unlocked but it's up to you to draw it out and i think that's almost the best way it can be explained all the archangels that have ever existed all the angels all the jinn all the demons all the spirits that have ever existed and ever will exist already exist inside you or as an aspect of yourself all you have to do is be able to communicate and tap into those aspects of the self if you want to utilize them so and that goes for the same 
as all these artifacts and whatever we talk about on this show in in accordance with enlightenment or self-realization and essentially that's that's it that all these aspects that you could ever need of the self already exist inside of you and when you figure out how to connect with them you really draw out that potential that you're looking to utilize in your life and i think that has been the show for today um i look forward to seeing you guys here next week um you know as always like and subscribe i know i don't usually say that but i should probably start saying that um you know you can follow me on instagram at top underscore sorcerer and this has been moonstruck podcast right here on right radio and i think we'll wrap it up here for this week if you enjoyed please let me know in the comment section and i will catch you back here next week with some more tips on how to improve our life see ya